All right. Welcome to the WTF Divorce Podcast. Today, I am very excited to be joined by Mark Groves. You might know him from Instagram as Create the Love. Mark, thanks for being here today. What's up, man? I'm so excited to be here. We were just talking about the simulation, and I, I always look back. I'm like, if five years ago you said I would be divorced talking to another guy about relationships, <laughs> I would be like, I used to be uh, a poker pro in Vegas. I'd be like, I'll give you a 10,000 to one. There's no chance any of those things were happening. Dude, I, I get it. I get it. You know, if you had asked me 10 years ago if I had, would have lived in Vegas and had a baby there, I would have said, are you nuts? <laughs> Actually, if you had asked me if I had a social media following, and then I would have also thought you were nuts. I, even that social media would be what it is today. The complete hijacking of our psyche, you know. Yeah, because you were. This wasn't your background. You were in a completely different world, just bumbling around like the rest of us, uh, ten, fifteen years ago. Yeah, and I made it to. Let me see. It was eighteen years ago that I uh, left a relationship. I didn't get to the divorce phase. I I, I stopped it at engagement, and uh, that really dismantled my whole world and wondered why I did what I did and why relationships last and why they don't. And at the time I was in sales, so I was deep in human behavior, but it was more from a manipulation perspective. I was working in pharma. And so I started to study romantic relationships and started to write about what I was learning, went back, studied positive psychology. And I, um, I never imagined it would bring me here much like you were saying, you know, I never met, you never imagined it would, You'd have a podcast talking to another dude about relationships. Like that's a, <laughs> it's a wild, this is the beauty of life. You know, you never know where your pain is going to bring you and just yeah. life is going to bring you your joy too. And I've convinced every like seven years, you cannot predict the future. Your life will be in a completely different place. Good, bad. It's just like, you just have to release and accept that. But when you were Growing up, I mean, did you did you have like male influence? Were you talking to your buddies about this stuff? That's what I find so fascinating hearing from other guys. Like maybe in my whole life, I've talked like six words about actual relationships with uh, guy friends. So there was just no education, really. I mean, I, I went to a Catholic school, so the school definitely didn't give me any education other than don't do it. <laughs> don't don't have <laughs> sex, but definitely get married. I. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm actually really blessed. My dad uh, would talk to us a lot about stuff. I mean, I can only speak for myself, not my brother or sister, but I talked to my dad a lot about my relationships and, and we would often sit in the living room and talk about human behavior and why people do what they do. And I feel really blessed for that. My father was divorced before he met my mother and he had a my sister in that marriage. And, and so, you know, even divorce was okay, you know, just through their existence, that was obvious. And, and so there was a, that you can find love again, you know, there was all these different messages that I was, that were really nourishing and healthy. And with my guy friends, yeah, yeah, you know, we used to lament a lot about relationship stuff. Um, not so much I'm in, in the sports teams or like in change rooms. That was more conversations about escapades. But yeah, with buddies, if things were going on, we would, there was a couple of friends that I, that I was really lucky to be able to chat with things about. Yeah, it's interesting that you said you're that having a parent that's gone through divorce, because I think that's what big thing we're trying to do is like, statistically, 50 plus percent of people are getting divorced. More people are breaking up. I always say, usually the breakup or get married, it's like a hard, a hard decision. But normalizing this idea of like things can end and it's gonna hurt and you can learn from it and grow from it and it's not like the end of the world because i think that's the stigma that we're still trying to break out from yeah when you look at the history of marriage it makes sense that human systems don't want people to get divorced because you know ultimately marriage was born from the idea of merging tribes of um marrying like the the group next to you the 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 other wealthy family you know it was a way of keeping rich people rich and poor people poor that still obviously has truth to it today so the foundations of marriage are not built on love they're not built on something as rocky as emotion and and love they're built on resources and and you know the marriage historian Stephanie Kuhn says that marriage is ultimately designed to get more in-laws 
you know, and <laughs> I like my in-laws, but not everyone loves theirs. So you might be wondering why the hell would I want more of those? I think that just at least gives a context that society sort of, uh, it doesn't sort of, it does uh, shame and exile people who go through divorce. So there's a lot of pain in divorces, especially because not just the ending of a relationship, obviously, that's really challenging and painful because of the story we talk, you know, we think about our, where our life's going, the love story we're going to have, the family we're going to have, all that stuff has to die. And it just might not look the same, but as you're saying, there is a possibility to actually navigate endings with love. And I would say it's the ultimate embodiment of unconditional love is to be able to transform the the container of the relationship or the state of it, going from romantic to co-parents to friends to maybe the if you don't have kids to a journey of not communicating anymore. But that that can happen and it can be done with grace and reverence and hold the pain of the ending. But, you know, if your community can't do that, like if you're part of a religious group or you're part of a family system that shames people who gets divorced and sends the message to stay no matter what, then you're breaking a family system. You're breaking uh, unconscious or even conscious explicit messages about what you're allowed to do in this family you do not, in this community you do not. So you're I've often thought like when someone says I don't want to date someone who's divorced, I'm like, well, depending obviously on why any relationship ends, that's important. But to me, I'm like, my wife's previously divorced. It's one of my favorite things about her because it's what woke her up, you know, and I'm sure for the person that gets to be in a relationship with you, that's a similar thing. It's like it to me, it's a it's like, wow, they they went against a system. They chose themselves. I actually don't know that there's a more beautiful expression of sovereignty and autonomy. At least I can trust them to tell me the truth, you know. And again, I obviously that's giving context to why someone gets divorced. If it's riddled with mountains of infidelity and repeated lies, that what I'm saying is not applicable, you know. But yeah. Yeah, I heard you in one of your clips. You were talking, uh, I think it was with Kylie, who... I think part of your backstory is that you did break up and get back together, which I, I want to hear about. But you were saying to her how like boundaries are hot. And I yeah. I say that all the time, too, because like there is something like if you can say no to me. If you can break up with somebody, then you can kind of implicitly trust them more because you're hearing it. And I, you know, I hear it the same way. It's like people want even if they don't like what they hear in the moment, you, it builds trust when somebody can like, you know, take care of themselves. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately you want someone who no matter how their relationship ends, uh, that they've reflected on the outcome of their relationship, how they contributed to it. What did they say yes to? What did they say no to? And that they're actually looking at their own behavior and that look like whether we like it or not, our relationship outcomes, we are the common denominator in all of them. So as much as we might even want to blame, let's say our relationship did end with infidelity on the other side, we still chose somebody who betrayed. Where did our own betrayals lead to that external betrayal? Again, this isn't victim blaming or shaming anybody, but rather to say, can we be with the truth that we also chose somebody and maybe missed red flags and participated in patterns of relationship that didn't end up great? And I think it's really, if you can take someone who's willing to tell you the truth and also be self-reflective, curious, open to feedback, willing to provide the same, you know, as you're saying, uh, someone who expresses a boundary, what an what a beautiful thing because they're really telling you how to love them and how to be in relationship with them, and then you can trust them that you're not going to engage in behavior that later you're going to pay for or or, or they're going to hold resentment to. Yeah, I think that's a thing that you see a lot about in marriage that goes goes sour. I mean, there is like this, and we're going to talk about it. That's what your uh, new book is about, which is called Liberated Love release codependent patterns, and create the love you desire. Uh, we all are a little, I always say we're on a spectrum. We're not codependent or not. We all have tendencies of that. And especially towards the end of a marriage, there's, a, imagine, a lot of that behavior on both sides. So like letting things slide or not speaking out or, you know, people pleasing when you're self-abandoning. Uh, is that something you see a lot in like clients that you work with that are divorced? Or is that just 
every human being in relationships. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's every human being. I think there's a lot of resistance to what's really happening. You know, if you can accept the truth of, of the relationship ending, like if you're getting divorced, your relationship is done. You know, and I think a lot of us, if someone is breaking up with you, your relationship is over. And a lot of us want to fight for something that the other person doesn't want to fight for. And I would say that's really important is to look for the pattern. You know, is this my history? Do I always fight more than other people fight for something? And maybe it's actually time for me to stop chasing people and allow people to just, you know, go on their path so I can go on mine. And because we leave our own center to do that. You know, I get asked a lot questions like, you know, how do I get someone to change? How do I get my partner to change? And it's like, you don't. You invite them to, and if they choose like a normal adult does, to actually engage in that change because it's important to them and important to you, uh, the person requesting it, then they will. But you can't, you can never do the work for two people. That's another thing that I see all the time is like, if I read enough books, they'll change. It is true that you can change how you engage with someone and they will naturally have to shift how they dance with you. So if you go from being someone who self-abandons to someone who now has boundaries, like I know someone who right now I have a client who's co-parenting and she's never stood up for herself in the co-parenting relationships. So now she is. So now she's rocking the boat, which the rocking of the boat is not evidence of her participating in a poor co-parenting relationship. It's actually her advocating for herself. But she has to be able to be with the the instability that comes with now shaking the system. So in divorce and breakups, yeah, I see that a lot where you have to advocate for yourself. Like a lot of people don't. When I went through my engagement ending when I was 27, I was like, what do you want? Take it all. I felt guilty. So I was like, oh, here, yeah, take this, take that, take that. Here's half the house. Here's everything. And I didn't advocate for myself. It was because I was afraid. I hurt her feelings. I felt guilty. And while I did hurt her feelings, and that was a fair experience um, to just, you know, we got engaged and then I ended it three months later, that would be pretty devastating for anybody who's not ready for it. A pretty confusing message. So I can own that. But it doesn't mean that I shouldn't advocate for myself because no amount of material given away or no amount of self-abandonment is going to minimize that. Like, they're not going to be like, ah, he gave me the MacBook. Like, and now I'm not as mad. You know? Right. Yeah. You brought up something there that I think about a lot. And I wonder if it's, uh, if guys take this on more of, you know, when you, we fear relationships because we're either going to get her, we're going to break up with somebody, we're going to get rejected, we're going to be rejecting, we're going to get our feelings hurt. But the like, not wanting to hurt somebody else's feelings, that's something that, you know, I always struggle with. I'm sure there's some codependent upbringing in there. What are your thoughts on like that pattern? Is that something you see more with guys yeah. or like, how do we reconcile? Like, I don't want to hurt their feelings. And then we end up in something where we're, where we're both uncomfortable. Such a beautiful question. Cause it really is asking like, what's the delineation between being caring and considerate and empathic and being codependent. And the real delineation is that, when other people's feelings are actually what dictates your behavior. So if I, it is natural for a human to care about hurting another human, but it is not relational for that, for me to not engage in a conversation with you because I'm afraid of your response, a necessary conversation, you know? So if like I'm in a relationship with someone and I don't want to tell them something because I'm afraid of how they'll respond, then there's a few things that are happening. One, I don't believe they have the capacity to hold what I'm sharing with them. That might actually be true, right? There could be truth to that. So I either have to shift how I'm relating because maybe the way I engage in dialogue is actually not great. So I haven't learned the skills yet. Um, or if I have, then two, I have to invite them to a different pattern, which is, hey, when you respond like that, here's how I feel and this is what's true for me. And if that happens again, here's what the consequence is. So there's like an invitation to change that behavior. Here's what I need from you. I'm really interested in creating a productive, loving, respectful relationship with you. Here's what that looks like. Here's what I'm committed to when you're ready to do that. Let's go. So there's that aspect of it. The other side is that if I'm 
holding back how I how what I want to say, and they haven't actually ever responded in a way that's I'm I'm guessing, then I'm never giving them the opportunity to hold the type of information I want to share. So then I feel like I can never share, and that's usually because of my childhood or because of previous relational experiences. So I'm not sharing. So now I'm mad at them, unconsciously resent them because I can't express everything. And they don't even know that any of this is actually going on. So that that's codependent. You know, I know I was working with someone recently who for three years has been ruminating about leaving uh, his partner. And I have had this conversation with him for, you know, I've, he's checked in every once in a while over these three years, but we always come to the same, he comes to the same conclusion, which is that he needs to leave, but he's afraid to hurt her. He finally um, walked away from the relationship recently and he feels like a million pounds have lifted off his shoulders. And the whole thing that kept him for three years was one, he's really caring, loving, and considerate guy. Um, as a kid, he really pivoted around his mother's emotions. So very much like the caretaker of the family. As an adult, the only, he, he spent so much of his time in relationship caretaking her feelings, always making sure she was okay, but not making sure he's okay. And you can't be fully engaged in a relationship without being engaged in yourself. Like, it's impossible. You know, it's great to orient around other people's feelings as long as it's not the co at the cost of your own. You know, and that's really how we define codependency in the book is that like you're, you're sourcing safety and security from something or someone at the cost of yourself, of your own well-being. And, I mean, hand up, who's done that? Me, I definitely have, you know? And so that's really where codependency is. Mm -hmm. It's normal for us to depend on humans. So healing codependency is not about being an island or not having needs. It's about having a self and the people in you're in relationship with, you're honoring their needs. And when those bump up against each other, which they do, you're able to dialogue and have conversations about what compromise might be needed and, and what's possible for the relationship that two people can coexist. Like, I don't want to be in a relationship with someone who doesn't advocate for themselves or doesn't have space to feel safe for their needs. I'm not interested. It's like, mm -hmm. then I can't trust them. Yeah, it's funny how many people like get married in their 20s. And obviously, you have the honeymoon phase in the beginning and they're sleeping together. So there's chemicals and you haven't even really had any of these conversations. So you don't even really get the practice. It's one reason I'd hopefully like my kids to wait a little bit, be in some relationships before they get engaged. But again, it's like not surprising people end up in divorce because they probably, they always say, oh, I didn't even know this person was like this. And it's because you never had any uh, practice. It sounds like, you know, with you and Kylie, you know, your first go around, did you know all these things? Or was it like, it was after that, they're like, oh, this is how I present myself in a relationship. I need to alter it. Yeah, you know, it was mixed because we definitely knew things about ourselves. Like I was still, you know, I was running Create the Love. I was teaching relationship stuff. So I definitely had self-awareness about it, but I didn't understand the deeper roots. Like that was what, that's what the book is written about is this correlation of like deep levels of codependency that because codependency as a term is most often associated with addiction. It's like Al-Anon, right? That's where the the word really has so much origin. Um, and the original book on codependency called Codependent No More by Melody Beattie is exceptional. And it's in the context of being in a relationship with an addict. Um, and we're like, man, this behavior shows up so much more in so many dynamics and for so many reasons. And there's not a lot of conversation about the person on the other side. Like the person who self-abandons and people pleases, yes, but men tend to find themselves more often uh, from an attachment perspective, men are more avoidant. And that makes sense. Developmentally, it makes sense. It makes sense how we treat men, that they become more avoidant. They shut down. I mean, I, I don't want to dive deep into this, but one of, the, one of the countries that has the highest level of circumcision is actually the U.S., and circumcision is not a medically necessary at all. It's got zero. It's religion masquerading as medicine, but and it's genital mutilation. Again, this is all. This isn't. This is an opinion. This is a fact. But what's interesting about it is when children get that experience, when boys have that done to them, 
they'll often say, oh, he didn't even cry. It's because he disassociated. So he's not even able to be in his body because of the level of pain. And that's a fracture with mother in the first eight days of life. I don't say that to project shame on anyone because, of course, the system teaches people to do these things. It's the systems that need change. But just the way that we look, if we were saying that about women, there is a zero tolerance policy for genital mutilation. Oh, that's understandable. Why is it not with men? You know, I find these types of things very interesting about men. It's like, of course, we can't look at our feelings. Of course, we don't dive deep into it. Who's Even when you hand people in studies a baby and you tell them it's a boy or a girl, they instantly treat them differently. So there are obviously brain differences in kids, you know, in babies that are between a male and a female. But also how we treat them is so different. And so you look at little boys, it's like, boys don't cry, like you're fine. But they're not fine, they're crying. And, and we do this with children, no matter the gender, but we especially do it with boys. So when it comes to relating as adults, we don't even have this access to it because no one empathized with us often. Obviously, there's different experiences for different people, but culture itself, like I didn't have boundaries. I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and I was taught that men are bad, men are evil, men are rapists. I'd say that line is even more solidified today, um, especially with the n newer terms like toxic masculinity, things like that. But it's like, Okay, if toxic masculinity is the exploitation of power, what's toxic femininity? Like, we at least need to explore these things. Even when I say a statement like that, it's incredible the resistance we have to it. But I'm just actually engaging in the same inquiry that we do towards men. And, and where there's toxic relationship dynamics, both sides are toxic. It's not just one. If toxic relationship dynamics exist, both people are toxic because we're engaging in it. So I say all that because if you are male or any gender and you have started this journey of introspection and you feel like you disassociate, you feel like you can't access a lot of your feelings, this journey is about thawing out your body. It's about calming your nervous system. It's about, so people who are avoidant are afraid of closeness because the story is that if you get close, you're going to get hurt. You know, and that's the unconscious story. People who are anxious are afraid of distance. We tend to find ourselves in relationship with people who verify our view of the world. So anxious people end up with avoidance and avoidance end up with anxious. It's just natural uh, because we're trying to heal something. So if I'm avoidant and someone is anxious and they chase me and they take up my space and they're overwhelming and maybe they're a bit controlling, it's actually part of my work to learn how to create boundaries so I can create space that's safe so that I can still preserve and protect my individuality. Um, if I am male and I'm really starting to make this exploration, then I have to actually rebel against the very definition of what masculinity is. You know, and you and I talked a little before we hit record about, like, even when men go through divorce and let's say they're not the breadwinner and then they're getting uh, alimony. I think that's the word that is that still being used? I'm Support, not sure. Support, alimony, right? Support. Yeah. Um, there's often shame taking it or receiving it. And that just shows how we we have a lot of obviously we have a lot of work to do, but there's a lot of grief that lives in this. Because if I've spent my whole life not being able to access feelings, then I have to grieve up until that moment, all the moments I've not been able to access my feelings that I've denied them. They existed. That society said Hey, you, if you have a boundary that's controlling, you're not safe to have any intensity. No, this, none of this is negating that men cause destruction or unhealthy, unintegrated men uh, can be very destructive and toxic. Of course not. I'm not negating any of that. That's true. But of the 100% of men I know, 99.999 are incredible. And, and like of all the men who engage in my work, Incredible. I, I obviously will have rare experiences. I think Vegas is a great place if you want to watch and study human <laughs> behavior. But there's just, I think it, we have to give so much context to that. Relationships require emotional intelligence, and yet we're not looking at all the ways that systems frame men to not have access to the emotional fluency that is required to create the relationships that are being asked of them today.
relationship structures were really structured around men. You and I were talking about that before too. Um, they were, and that's not good. Like in the language of Harriet Lerner, it would be like men were typically under functioning and women were over functioning. So men, you know, sit, watch the game, get a beer brought to them. Like that's, it, 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 that's not a structure of relationship. It might seem like it's great, but Sweet it's not gig, because yeah. neither person is actually happy. Mm-hmm. Neither, sorry, neither person is deeply connected to themselves. And you can't treat another person and exploit them and be in your heart. It's impossible. But if it's what you're grown up taught and you learn to unlearn it is a huge thing. It's kind of like religion. You can be born and be part of a religion and then realize that that religion doesn't fit for you or that religion might have been judgmental or toxic. And so you have to unlearn it, but you know no other thing. And, you know, much like I've had to do is like unlearn things about behavior, engagement and communication, you know, which I know you've expressed you've had to too. And like what a gift that is, but also you got to grieve it, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. That was a long, uh, that was a long rant. Well, and as we talked about before, I think women naturally have more of a community. They're talking about this stuff with friends. Uh, it sounds like you do have some close guy friends we can talk about, but I would say divorce, especially for men, is very isolating because very. it does hit them. You know, there is 80% initiated by women. So it's like all this stuff hits them. They have no real context of why it happened. We want to blame somebody, want to feel like victims, but we do need to do the work. But it's like, uh, it's, it's a lot of it's done in isolation, which, you know, going full circle, like I think is the incredible value of pages like yours, podcasts like these, because it's a way for people to, I never heard about any of this, you know, five years ago. So it's like we have this awakening, this renaissance of relational information, which I also wonder sometimes, like, do we know too much? Like, is the gap, you know, if some, if you're (laughs) dating somebody that follows you and all these things and, and, you know, they've read all the books and they're dating a guy that's never heard any of this, all of a sudden, like that relationship might've worked. 10 years ago, but now somebody's, you know, they're at mile 24 and they're way behind. So I I don't think divorces are going to be going down. I actually think they're going to be going up because people are learning. The the acceleration of the learning curve is just really happening fast now. I remember when I looked at the data, I want to say like eight years ago, it was showing that divorces were going down, but that's because less people were getting married. Mm -hmm. Uh, people are getting married older and if you get married older your relationship is more likely to work out that's not a shocker Um, and uh, the birth control pill because all of a sudden now you know accidental babies were not causing marriages for people who shouldn't get married people in Vegas Mm -hmm. (laughs) have one night stands I um, yeah everything you're saying is really it's a beautiful reflection of what's happening which is that you know Women do initiate divorce more than men. And in research, women turn to their partner about 30-something percent of the time for emotional stuff. So 60% of the time, they turn to friends. Men, it's the opposite. They turn to their partner 60-something percent of the time. So when they lose their relationship, they lose their support system. And that's why men are more likely to get remarried. And so I think it just really speaks to like, you know, one of the most predictive questions of someone's mental health is, do you have someone to call at 2 a.m.? And a lot of men don't. And, you know, divorce is very isolating. That's why podcasts like this are so great, because all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm not alone. And like, it's easy to fall into the red pill world, you know, which if you're listening and you're like, what's that? It's like the men's extremist kind of space. But I understand the anger that's there. But I also I'm like, that's not productive because now we're just like creating a group of martyrs who are upset at systems and unfairness and da 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 da. But it's like at the end of the day, if we're just to audit our experience as men, it's like, do we have work to do? <laughs> yes or no? Yes. Could we become more relational? Yeah. Could we be better at emotionally at emotional fluency and communication? Yeah. Could I do that? Oh, you definitely. Okay, like that's the work. If 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 someone builds emotional fluency, if, especially if a man does, 
he'll master relationship. I don't mean that that uh, that he's going to be better than a female. I just mean that if a man finally does it and develops that mastery, he will create a beautiful world. Just like anyone will, but I think the call is really more for us, mm-hmm. you know. Because we, as you, we were talking about, like eighty-five percent of my following is female. Mm-hmm. So if you're a man and you're listening to this, I'm like, take full charge of your divorce and change your damn life, right? You know, like you have this opportunity to come fully alive that you did. You know, I did it through my breakup. It was like, okay, like let's get good at this. Imagine if we put the same effort into that as we do into our fantasy football <laughs> yeah it's so true i mean it's so, it can be like grating to hear Not like divorce is an op- opportunity you know you hear that because there is short term i always tell people like it's going to get worse it's going to feel worse at first but like if you're in some mediocre marriage you're you're never really going to get the space to break out of this so like lick your wounds you know be depressed for a little while but it is the opportunity and again we we a want to be in another relationship at some point, so we probably don't want to go repeat the pattern and get divorced again. And the big one, and I know you've got a, a son now, is like it would be nice if our kids like grew up with a better like idea of what a relationship looks like. So if nothing else, if we can model better behavior for them, like think about the generational uh, change we can make that actually is a positive from divorce. Um, right. That's exactly it. It's like, can we take our bags back that we hand to our kids and can we pass the bags back up if, you know, whether they're alive or not doing the work does that. And, you know, I think a lot about how relationship, like the frictions of relationship, whether it's breakup or just the, we're fighting about the same things, we're picking the same types of people. All of those are an indication that we have a pattern that has not been resolved. And so for me, the potency of that emotion of a breakup, I don't know that there's a more transformative energy, to be honest, because like if someone's in a mediocre relationship, there's not really much motivation. Even like, think about it. By the time a woman initiates, I'm not happy. It takes two years before she leaves, before that 70, 80% divorce. But before that, most of the time, not all the time, she's been sharing what she actually needs. Now, women have a more accurate barometer of relationship. I'd say that's probably evolutionary, you know, as as just like a motivation of behavior. Is like if a woman gets pregnant or dependent on resources, which historically that's how human systems work, uh, then they needed a relationship more than men, quote unquote. I'm not saying that's actually true. In the world of Beyonce's and, and Adele's and all that, that's obviously not true today. But there's truth to it when a woman's pregnant. And so women have a more accurate barometer for the health of a relationship, and they have less tolerance for relational uh, dysfunction or instability. Like They could bring that forward to men like, hey, I'm not happy. Things aren't good. And they're like, what do you mean you're not happy? Like, things are good. But they obviously aren't, because if they're not good for one person, then they're not good for both people. And so I think we... We have an opportunity now. Mm-hmm. Well, so let's bring We do get a lot of questions. Uh, and because we, you know, a lot of what you're talking about is dating and relationships. And that's a big part of divorce. You're now going to be, you know, dating again. Oh, uh, yeah. This is a question that we get a lot is uh, I got comfortable being alone. Now dating is disappointing me. What to do? We finally are, you know, figuring yourself out. And now you're putting yourself back into the world. Well, you know, there's a saying that your wounds occur in relationship and that's where they get healed. So a lot of us, after we go through, especially a painful breakup or divorce, actually become avoidant. So we actually avoid relationship. We we get our poop in a group as a single person. And then we're like, ah, now I got to re-enter this. How do I know I'm ready? A really good question for that is like, does it excite you, but it's scary? You know, like if you were offered a job opportunity that required you to grow, you didn't know what you were doing, but you knew you needed to take it. It's kind of sensing into the same feeling Um, because a lot of us don't trust ourselves in relationship, in dating. So we avoid dating and just say, we're done with it. I hate apps. I hate everything. No one talks anymore. Everyone's afraid of commitment. These are all ways that we avoid intimacy and connection. 
because all you got to do is just look at one couple that met online and is successful. Well, obviously that disproves our story. Meet a nice person. Well, that disproves my story. So it's like these beliefs that we hold deeper down are really protective. And so when we're re-engaging in dating, start to look at it as an adventure. What an opportunity to practice, to flex your new skills, to stand in what you desire. Notice in your body when you might compromise what you really want to say or what you really want from a relationship or compromise your deal breakers. It's like just starting to play with how you feel. Don't If you go on a date with someone, they're not your forever. Right? You can you can actually be like, I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to explore how I communicate and how I respond to someone maybe not texting me or someone ghosting me. Right? Because all of these are just different ways that we can play with uh our communication and our boundaries and our all that kind of stuff. I agree. I know and guys, we're not good at it. I jump right on the apps after divorce, like the dumb guy that I am. And I think women tend to take a year, take some time. But I always say like, you're right when you get in that first relationship, it's all going to flood back to you. So you do, have to, you do have to practice, you know, do take time for yourself, but you're going to get a lot of like experience in a relationship that you just cannot get on your own. Yeah, you're going to need to explore the grief of the loss of your relationship and look at how you showed up if you want to not recreate the same patterns. You know, a different person is not going to all of a sudden just affirm everything about you. You know, and that's, you know, that saying to get over your ex, get under the next, that is not actually productive advice. It might feel good, but then we use things like arousal as a way to treat our grief. You know, we use friends with benefits. We use one night stands. We use all these things uh, often, not always, but as a way to actually be outside our bodies, you know, like leave the feeling of the pain of the rejection. And I would say that if you're going through a breakup or divorce, you should get, you should be sober. I think that's a really good, because you don't want, you don't want to add to that. And, you know, you say I, sober, I, you mean like relationally sober or like alcohol? Well, I mean, so I everything. think both, but you should stop yeah. drinking during that time. Mm -hmm. um, I say that now with a more mature perspective. When I was 27 and ended my engagement, my friends had a reverse bachelor party for me. <laughs> so like, I get it. I'm only saying that now I understand that sobriety during my last breakup was necessary. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, the feeling, the pain, the discomfort. It's the hardest part, but I guess that's the cost of admission if you want to uh, better yourself and have better yeah. relationships. Exactly. Well, Mark, I uh, appreciate this. I've been looking forward to this interview. Mark has a new book out when this podcast comes out. It's called liberated love release codependent patterns and create the love you desire uh you can find mark on instagram at create the love uh thank you so much mark for being on the show today man thanks so much for having me and uh for everyone listening like that book is about understanding the relationship blueprint that you come from um it overarches my wife and i's story where we were together then we broke up and and we took time apart we weren't expecting to get back together and then got back together about 10 months later. So it's the journey of like understanding what, what creates, why you do what you do, how to heal that, how to change that, and how to create the relationship that uh, celebrates both people. So yeah, well, and I appreciate like that it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I like that it's based on experience. There's so much like theory of what you should do. And it's like, here's where I screwed up. Here's where I was an idiot. Here's where we went through this. And it's so much more relatable when you can like talk about your own experiences, the good and the bad. Yeah, thanks, Rob. I really appreciate you having me on and, and, and trusting me with your audience and for you listening. Thank you for trading time. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, man.